The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was created by the United Nations in 1988 to provide objective scientific information to better understand human-induced climate change. Its first climate assessment report in 1990 provided the first insight into how a 1.5 degrees Celsius global temperature rise would see devastating effects on our climate leading to wildfires, more frequent and intense storms, and massive ice melt in the Arctic. It was clear that global climate action was needed. 31 years later, the IPCC's latest report states that a 1.5 degree rise is now inevitable, stating that this milestone will be reached by 2040, and that if emissions aren't slashed in the next few years, this will happen even earlier meaning it is now this generation that will face the consequences of humanity's impact on our planet and the need to drastically accelerate change at all levels has to happen now. Extreme E was created with sustainability and working towards a better future at the core of everything it does. One of the ways it planned to massively reduce its carbon footprint was to transport the cars and infrastructure by sea to each race location. And in order to do just that, they purchased their own ship, the RMS St. Helena. In active life as a Royal Mail ship, she would sail between Cape Town and the remote island of St. Helena, a five-day voyage, delivering post, day-to-day -day supplies and inhabitants to and from the island. To most, it was just a ship, but to some, it's so much more and became an important part of their lives. I started off with a vessel in Hall Russell in Aberdeen when it was being built in about 1989-1990 and then was on here for the next 27 years. There she goes. The reluctant starter, and she's away. The island of St. Helena had no airstrip, and the St. Helena was the only vessel that went there. So we took 2,000 tonnes of cargo and 155 passengers. Holidaymakers, islanders, royalty, we took everybody and everything there. It's got a special place in thousands of people's hearts. You know, over the, over the years there must have been tens and tens of thousands of people travelled on it. The vessel was enormously important for the islanders of St. Helena, but now it's got another new lease of life. It's got the same name, so it will get attention wherever it goes in the world. For the St. Helena's new life, a mammoth task of rebuilding and refitting the engine and interior was needed to make her more sustainable and bring her up to date. I was tasked with the uh, our total renovation, refurbishment of, uh, of St. Helena. I don't think anybody could have envisaged how much work she needed to bring her to the new state that she's in now. There's not one part of the main engines that haven't been taken apart and refurbished and renovated. Generators, boilers, steelwork. She now burns low sulfur fuel. The engines are as efficient as, as they ever could be. And what you see before you is a refurbished, renovated vessel that couldn't be any better. We were thinking how to create a nice looking uh, place without damaging the environment. If you scrap the whole thing and then start over, it's a big carbon footprint. The previous furniture was left in the cabins and was decorated. And that is a fantastic approach, you know, rather than throwing everything out, putting everything new. There was a lot of um, effort to look at environmentally friendly material, which paint we are using, which wallpaper we are using. Some of the furniture that we used, they've been recycled plastic, which are collected from Mediterranean. And that's the way that we have done the interior, actually. That was always carefully researched. 
As well as ensuring a sustainable refurbishment of the ship, this approach was also taken to the already tricky task of feeding the crew and guests whilst travelling around the world. Everything becomes a little bit more difficult when you're cooking on a ship, from the working environment to you know, the fact that we can't just nip to the shops and, and buy ingredients if we run out of them. We've really got to plan ahead, make sure that we've got everything in store before we leave port. Sourcing the ingredients locally is not only more ethical, but the quality will be better because it's not doing as many miles. It'll be fresher, it'll have more flavor. Um, and, and also it kind of creates a theme for the guests. You know, they want to taste the area in which they're at. When we were in Birkenhead, we loaded 72 pallets and there was probably about 20 tons of food that went on board. Most of that's going to be wiped out by the time we finish Saudi Arabia. We've got over 50 crew on board, so that's, you know, large scale catering every day, even without guests. And then when we're going up to 150 guests as well, that's over 200 people on board that need to be fed three times a day. This is a grow cabinet and you can grow all your own herbs, lettuces, edible flowers, things like that. This one here, the sorrel, this has been growing ever since the beginning, which is now about two months. You can just prune it back when you need it and it will just keep growing. So it's like a little sorrel forest. I mean, you tell anyone, buy a sheep, put a car in it, do a championship around the world. Who would have believed it? After two years of hard work, the St. Helena was ready to transport the all-electric series around the world and become the heart and soul of the championship. I'd always had an interest in the RMS St. Helena. What she did, the fact that she was one of the last serving Royal Mail ships, it was always an interest for me. And then when I found out what she was doing now in her new life of Extreme E and what Extreme E stood for with the climate action and the electronic cars, it really appealed to me. And to see her now in the state she's in, doing what she was bought for, you know, serving her purpose for Extreme E, it's a really amazing thing. It's been a learning curve for everybody. You've gained so much experience in so many different areas. Um, and I'm very thankful to have been a part of that. Everything has really been a first for St. Helena. It's unique. We're the only ship that's purely transporting race cars around the world. Somebody tells you you've got to fit so many containers, so many cars on board and then we had to figure out the best way to do it. I don't think there hasn't been a day where I haven't had a challenge but there also hasn't been a day that I haven't enjoyed. You have a large team of people working towards a common goal and then seeing all that team achieving the goal and everybody happy at the end of it, that fills you with pride. Uh, Boats and bridges, guys. We're a cruise ship, we're a super yacht, we're a cargo ship. It's such an unusual kind of trio combination. They've been a great team and, you know, really, really worked hard. The amazing part of the journey uh, with Extreme is taking such an iconic ship around the world. It's a dream come true, it's a privilege, you know, absolute privilege to be here. As the St. Helena is unloaded for the third round of the championship, the Arctic X Prix, plans are being put in place for where it will be sailing to next for the series' new fourth race location. Unfortunately, the original fourth and fifth rounds of the series, the Amazon X Prix in Brazil and the Glacier X Prix in Patagonia, regrettably have been postponed until Extreme E's second season due to the ongoing situation surrounding coronavirus in South America. Replacing the fourth round of this series is the Island X Prix, which will take place on the Italian island of Sardinia to highlight the effects of issues such as wildfires and bring the world's attention to how devastating climate issues are not just happening in remote locations and are getting closer to home. The Extreme E Paddock is made up of teams from all different backgrounds, and Veloce Racing, originally known for being a driving force in the e sports world, expanded their operations into real life racing and were one of the first teams to enter Extreme E. Their driver lineup of Jamie Chadwick and Stefan Sarazan were looking to make an impact for Veloce's first off road endeavour during the opening round in Saudi Arabia. 
Stefan was pushing hard on the team's first qualifying run. Steph Sarazan on a mission here. Big sideways moment for Sarazan, oh. rolls here! Stefan Sarazan's rolled the car! Yeah, so our weekend was over before it even started. Um, you know, I didn't even get the chance to drive competitively. But yeah, an unfortunate start, but a long way to go. That huge crash meant they were unable to race for the rest of the weekend. With the worst possible start to the championship, the only way was up in round two, as they put in two problem-free qualifying sessions, securing a spot in the semi-final. Reigning W Series champion Jamie Chadwick took the start, and despite some great defensive work behind the wheel, came into the switch zone in third place, leaving Sarazan to chase down Christine GZ in the Excite Energy Cup. Taking an alternate line into gate 24 set up his chance to take the lead. Sarazan gets it done. Aggressive move with an alternate line. Better exit speed. Great move. Holding on after that brilliant move, the two-time Le Mans champion secured Veloce's spot in the final. With Stefan starting, he managed to avoid contact at the start straight and into turn one, passing a terminally damaged JBXE and X44 car on the way. He handed over to Jamie Chadwick to restart the race after the red flag was called in order to remove the broken down cars on track. Despite a great start from Jamie, she couldn't hold off Johan Christofferson in the RXR machine and brought it home for a second place finish. P9 last time out and this time second step of the podium. Sitting eighth in the championship, Veloce will be looking to carry their newfound momentum into the Arctic X Prix and force their way into the business end of the standings before heading into the championship deciding fourth and fifth rounds of the series. Innovative and green technologies are a key part of Extreme E. But in a developing country like Senegal, where access to computers and technology are harder to come by, community-based educational centers play an important role. The Fab Lab is a multimedia public digital space where artists and makers within the local community come together to create as well as educate the youth in computing, engineering and design. To find out more, Veloce Racing drivers Jamie Chadwick and Stefan Sarazan were given the opportunity to visit the organization and take a tour of the facility. Fab Lab is a maker space where we try to invite craftsmen, students, engineers to learn technology using uh, machines like 3D printers, laser cutters, and uh, we focus a lot on sharing knowledge, how you can learn from others. We are partners of Theo.org and uh, we work on um, plastic recycling machine. We work with the garbage uh, organization of the city, but also with Oceanium that is a partner to clean the beach. So the idea is to try to do from artistic object to medical object or to sport object. So it's a wide range of uh, objects we can do with recycling local plastic. Bon, bienvenue dans notre Donc, ça veut dire que là, si vous avez une idée d'un projet que vous voulez réaliser, vous venez dans le Fab Lab, vous allez rencontrer les différentes personnes qui ont des différentes compétences. Là, en, dans un projet, on a besoin de plusieurs compétences. Donc, alors le Fab Lab, on trouve plusieurs compétences. On peut trouver des électroniciens, des informaticiens, des ingénieurs, des artistes, même nous et des artisans qui fréquentent dans le Fab Lab. Fab Lab and Extreme E can work really well together because there's a lot of similarities between what they're doing and what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to educate at Extreme E and I think that's what they're trying to do here as well. And, you know, they're very aware of the plastic pollution. They're taking a lot of that plastic waste and recycling it into stuff that they can use here, teaching the kids. And it's great to sort of have those parallels between what we're doing and what they're doing. With two races of five in the opening season complete, and the Arctic X Prix rapidly approaching, the battle to become the inaugural Extreme E champion is super close. X44, founded by Lewis Hamilton, has one of the strongest driver pairings on the grid. With Cristina Gutierrez, the second woman in history to win a stage of the Dakar Rally, alongside arguably the biggest name in the off-road racing world, nine-time World Rally champion Sebastian Loeb. When the team arrived in Saudi Arabia, they made sure to show the rest of the paddock exactly what they were made of and qualified in first place. 
Day two saw them line up for the first wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing action. And after a hard-fought start in the semi-final, they slotted into second place and held on to secure a spot in the final. Loeb lined up against the 2019 World Rallycross champion, Timmy Hansen, and the reigning World Rallycross champion, Johan Christofferson. Unfortunately for Seb, his competition was the least of his problems. I think Loeb's got some sort of uh, an issue there. He, he was really struggling. No power steering, no power steering. Despite that bad luck, it was a great opening weekend for the team and momentum was on their side as they took to the beaches of Senegal. They once again delivered under pressure and put together some excellent laps to secure the best time overall in qualifying and even more championship points. In the semi-final, they battled hard with Abd Kukra and RXR on lap one, but as they headed into the switch zone, they were in third place and a chance of the finals was slipping away. Luckily for them, a communication issue for Apt Cooper during the driver switch saw them pass the race leaders and take second place. Christina was all over Molly Taylor, but wasn't able to take the lead and cross the line in second, meaning they would go head to head once again in the final. A drag race off the line saw the drivers go door to door, and after plenty of fighting, it was Christina and her rival Molly Taylor who were neck and neck going into the first turn. This is a real good battle between the two of them because they're not having to take the line they wanted to. Oh, disaster there for the Hamilton car. It's been pushed out really wide, lost so much time. I come over, guys, sorry. With damage after the contact with RXR, meaning they couldn't continue, they finished fourth overall. It was another disappointing end for the team, but with two qualifying wins and two trips to the final in the opening rounds, they've secured a strong points haul and a second in the championship. Will they continue their qualifying success in the Arctic X Prix and dethrone Rosberg X Racing en route to the top step of the podium? One of the ways Extreme E assures it stays in the lead in the race towards a sustainable future is by having its own scientific committee that study each race location to help better understand the climate issues they're facing and how to best combat them. Professor Richard Washington, a founding member of the committee, sat down with X44's founder Lewis Hamilton at the Science Museum in London to discuss the climate issues facing the Arctic and how they will impact the rest of our planet. So the third race, is the Arctic x in Greenland. Have you been? I haven't been to Greenland, I can't wait to go. I, I heard that there is a million years of snow that's turned into ice. Can you imagine that? I think it's stacked up three and a bit kilometers high and a few teams in the 90s dug a, a core through those three kilometers. And uh, it's almost an annual record of, of climate. And that record showed uh, for the first time that the Earth system flick-flacks in between those states of extreme cold and heat. I'm sorry, what do you mean flick-flacks? Uh, it, it can go from being warm and mild like now yep. to an ice age and then back again in six to ten years. Okay. And, and we had to understand how this happened because if you provoke a system like that, it's going to bite you back. Mm. And we've got this million years of, of snow and ice, three and a bit kilometers deep, that we're melting much faster than scientific predictions of just a few years ago. Yeah. If we melt all of the Greenland ice sheet, then sea levels rise seven meters. Wow. Which means that any number of cities around the world, along the coast, take your pick, will be submerged. Does it make sense us going there and racing these cars around on, on this surface? What does that actually do? Is it, is it worthwhile us going? Yeah, the idea is very careful selection of site. The race, as I understand it, is, is off the ice sheet. And given the way that uh, Extreme E works, I'm, I'm confident that the right choices are made. Uh, it's essential. Yeah. It is a fragile environment. So once we go there, the learnings that we find, what's the plan for what we leave there? It's not a race this week and then we're gone. Yeah. We're partnering with the UNICEF to do education for skill kids on yeah. climate change, where we're doing things like simple maths, but with climate change backdrop to it, Great. so with temperature rises or a consequence in terms of carbon Fantastic, and so on. Yeah. Um, it is about education, so you know, we were not fortunate enough to, to know about these things when we were 
uh, little one at school. So I think this is going to be fantastic. Exactly, and and what a wonderful thing for the uh, children of, of Greenland to grow up knowing exactly what they're living next to this wonderful yeah. archive of past climate, but the threat that it holds to the to the world. It's it's easy to be told that that ice sheet is melting, but when you see images of it and how big it is, yeah. it, it means something else. And it's probably the most important subject of today, I would say. Well said. Being a successful racing team is about much more than just raw pace. And as the classic motorsport saying goes, in order to finish first, first, you must finish. One team who haven't been the quickest but are still very much in the championship fight are Excite Energy Racing, with Oliver Bennett and Christine Giampaoli Zonka behind the wheel. In Saudi Arabia, they struggle to match the speed of their rivals, but with other teams crashing out during qualifying, they made it into the crazy race. Oliver Bennett took the start and battled his way past former F1 champion Jensen Button to secure second place. But the pace of the Andretti United car ahead was too much, and with only the fastest team making it through to the final, their weekend ended there. I'm sorry, guys. In round two in Senegal, they couldn't match the pace of the front runners, but once again capitalized on the misfortune of their rivals. With three other teams having problems during qualifying, they once again made it into the semi-finals and kept their hopes of securing the Ocean X Prix title alive. They lined up against Veloce Racing and JBXE, who had a brilliant start and left the other two teams to fight amongst themselves for the last spot in the final. Jamie Chadwick took control at turn one, but constant pressure from Bennett and a technical issue with the Veloce car saw him secure the overtake towards the end of the lap. He handed over to Christine, who couldn't hold off attacking Stefan Sarazan. But as the end of the lap approached, she made a last ditch effort to get back the place. After a hard fought battle, Christine couldn't make the pass and they came in third, losing out on a place in the final. Having avoided any technical issues across both of the opening two rounds, they've collected 37 points and sit joint fourth in the championship. If they can improve their race pace and continue their problem-free run for the Arctic X Prix, they'll be the dark horse to watch in the race for the championship crown. With round three, the Arctic X Prix in Kangalusuak, Greenland being the most remote location on the calendar so far, it hosts new challenges for the Extreme E team to overcome. We're in Kangalusiak, Greenland, and we're here because we first of all need to find the course. We basically recce the whole area, we find interesting spots, anything that could be technical that we can use for the course, and then we map it out, and then from that we start planning um, the paddock and all the other elements of the event. In total, we'll be looking at about 700, 750 people, so it's about 500 staff and teams. When we come here, we need to look for accommodation, we need to look at the transport things and how everyone gets about. It's a super remote location, so uh, you know, resources are really limited. The other thing is obviously bringing so many people to small places. It's looking at how we can reduce our footprint and what we what we actually do, you know, events can sometimes not be that sustainable, but something that we really focus on is making sure that we leave no trace and that if we do leave anything, it's actually uh, like a legacy and something that is positive behind. It's truly spectacular, it's incredible. When you come here, it's so vast and it's, uh, it's nothing like you've ever seen before. It's really incredible and I think you read a lot about climate change and it's not until you come to such a fragile environment that you actually can see the changes. Bringing the world's attention to the issues climate change is causing in Greenland is key, as it not only affects the local area, but will affect our planet globally. Here I am standing on top of the Greenland ice sheet. In the past, you wouldn't get any melt of the Greenland ice sheet, even in summer. But now, the whole ice sheet is covered with these rivers of water which are running out to sea. And we can also see that the ice is black. Um, what's happened is as the ice sheets melted, all the dirt that was in the ice has now gathered at the top because the ice itself has gone. And as it gets blacker, it reflects less solar radiation and that means it melts even faster. We're seeing a kind of dying of the Greenland ice sheet. If all of the ice on the Greenland ice sheet melted, 
then sea level would rise by seven meters and most of the Earth's coastal cities would be flooded. It's a very serious situation. It's for these reasons why Extreme E has set this stunning landscape to host the third round of the championship, to bring the world's attention to the issues our planet faces, as the teams and drivers will battle it out on ice, gravel and dirt in the series' coldest climate yet, as the championship begins to really heat up. <laughs>